Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webcast. We are live on the campus of Duke University. I'm Deborah Norville. I am proud to be moderating this discussion with some of our fellow Duke parents. I am a Duke parent. I have a son who's a senior, another son who will be entering as a freshman, a member of the class of 2017, and my husband, Carl Wellner, and I are national co-chairs of the Duke Parent um, Annual Fund Committee. So we are very involved at Duke, as are the three parents who are with us here this evening to talk about what their students' experience has been. It's so nice to welcome to our panel. First, we'll start at the end, uh, Wendy Broadbent. Wendy is from Ridgewood, New Jersey. She is the mother of John, who is a junior here at Duke, class of 2014. John's a classical studies major who is uh, pretty sure he wants to go to law school when he graduates, and he has some wonderful um, notches in his belt already. He has obtained an internship at the Blackstone Group this summer, which is a very, very um, impressive thing to do. He is also active on campus, a member of the marching band, the drum line. You may have seen him uh, during Duke's uh, road toward the Final Four, although we didn't quite get it. And um, he is later this month going to be presenting a TED Talk. So pretty impressive for a young man who was a junior here at Duke. Welcome, Wendy. We're glad to have Thank you. Thank you. Also with us here on the panel is Supriya Chakaborty. He is from <coughs> Tarzana, California, the father of Pyle, who is a sophomore here at Duke, who I need to take a deep breath when I explain everything that she is doing. She is majoring in neuroscience, minoring in chemistry. She's working on her global health certificate, and she's also at the same time fulfilling all of her pre-med requirements. That's just for starters. She's also busy tutoring students here in Durham at the high school in math, and she is active on campus in a service organization along with a lot of other things. I know you're a proud papa, and we're glad that you're here today, too. And finally, rounding out our panel is a woman whose daughter has graduated from Duke just barely. Penny Canada's daughter is Tracy. She graduated in 2012. Uh, Penny is from Greensboro, North Carolina, down the road. And uh, Tracy is also an overachiever. She is a double major in cultural anthropology and Spanish. She was really active during her years here at Duke, working in a number of offices as a football relations um, assistant, working in the Office of Undergraduate admissions, working in the Office of Dean of Academic Affairs, and she now has a job there, so she obviously impressed the right people there. Welcome. Thank you. I want to ask all of you, before we get into questions, and we want you to send us your questions, just hit the hashtag, send us the questions, email us, because this is for you parents. We know your student has been accepted to Duke University. Hooray for that. Pressure off although you may not yet have made the final decision to accept that invitation to be a part of the class of 2012. We're here to try to answer questions for you and help you understand from a parent's point of view what it would be like if your child is coming to Duke. And for those of you who've already sent the uh, acceptance back to the university, we are thrilled you're going to be here. And here's a little bit of what your student can expect. Why did you agree to be a part of this panel? You took time out of your day, you traveled from California, you traveled from New Jersey, you've been in the car for a long time getting here. You had better things to do, but for some reason you said yes to the invitation. Why? Probably the reason I'm here to let the parents know <coughs> how great the school is and what experience they can have during the four years undergraduate. And uh, seeing the uh, the university it looks like a gothic structure in the middle of uh, <laughs> uh, a national park and the environment, right, which is right for the mindset of a student to achieve what they want. It really is beautiful here. Mm -hmm. It does just get you in this sponge-like atmosphere that I'm just going to soak in all this wonderful knowledge that's around here. Penny, why why'd you say yes? Um, because Tracy had a great experience. She really liked it here. This was her dream school to come here since she was a little girl. And so once she got here, she really excelled and she did a good job. So I'm here to just tell everybody else that you can do that too. Great. <laughs> Wendy? Well, I'm honored to be part of this panel. Um, from the day my son has come to the school, he has been ecstatic. Um, he has special needs um, and the school has embraced him from the get-go and it has helped him transform his life and he is just happy every single day. So we've got a junior, a sophomore, and a recent grad. So let me ask each of you, what has your child's academic experience been like? Because that's what they're here. We're going to get into the fun part of being at Duke, but tell me a little bit about the academics. Um, your daughter was a double major. That's a huge undertaking. A lot of kids do it, but it requires a lot of organization on the student's part. 
Um, Tracy is very organized and uh, she would plan, she's a planner, so she would know exactly when items were due and what she needed to do and what courses she needed to take to, to get the goal. I tell everybody that she is focused. So she was focused on what she wanted to do and how she wanted to get there in the least amount of time. And, and, and what about John? Uh, he's majoring in classics and has been able to combine um, a challenging but balanced academic program with the marching band and all of the Duke sports that uh, the marching band supports. And as a result, has had a challenging but very balanced and happy experience. What does he do when time management becomes an issue? Um, or maybe it doesn't. I mean, I know you've got a plan, but marching band takes a lot of time. It does. Um, they do go to the games and they're assigned which games to go to. And classics isn't exactly, you know, sort of a, a layup major. That's a, that's a very challenging course of study. <laughs> Um, how does he, time manage? I wouldn't say time management has been one of his biggest strengths. I think that Duke has um, taken that um, skill to a much higher level, has forced it to go to a much higher level. Um, he is probably a typical college student and functions well after 11 o'clock. <laughs> um, and he has a high energy level and is able to get the work done through the wee hours of the night. Right. Um, but I, I've never felt with John that he's um, over his head, and there have been terrific resources. Uh, the faculty has been available. Uh, the students are, are collab collaborate with each other, and it, it all seems to work out. And he's learning how to, to study on, on the run, which he's probably going to need in his work life. Yeah, exactly. Your daughter, um, Pyle, has the scientific um, course of study represented here. Is it different for her um, than for a more, you know, liberal arts focused major? Um, not really. You know, um, Duke has a program that uh, not going to stop any students to take any courses. For example, if it's art, uh, if you're in uh, Trinity or Pratt, you can take classes from the Pratt or Trinity, and um, like um, you know, you can make your um, seamless decision when you are um, saying that what major are you going to take. Um, for example, uh, Payal, when she started, she was in the Pratt doing robotics because you know that's her background. She was the three times winner in the world championship, so uh, she tried uh, marine robotics. Uh, and taking classes uh, in Pratt. Also, she is trying, uh, for example, uh, computer science, which also Duke has a uh, beautiful way to take that when you are taking a computer science, mm -hmm. how you can apply to a pre-med curriculum. And, and so when you are not just biology, biology or science, you can take courses from other interest and apply towards your major or, or concentration. That, that to me, prompts, a, a, I think, a very important question um, that, frankly, as a parent, I still am not sure I understand, and that is when you are selecting your courses, you have your major courses, your minor courses, but Duke also has if you will, little buckets. You have to take a few courses from this bucket and a few mm -hmm. courses from that bucket, the idea being that, that we're here to educate a well-rounded whole child. How much help does your student get from faculty, from an academic advisor? It could be their residence advisor. Maybe it's their best friend down the hall. How much help do they get in deciding what's the best way to strategize that part of the process of being a Duke student? Well, you know, when Pyle came and saw the possibilities, there's so many offerings from the university, and she says, oh, I want this, I want that, I want that, and overwhelmed her a little bit. Yeah. Then it became to her, you know, now I get a call in midnight, said, Dad, I'm struggling. Um, the facts, okay, and... And, and facts is the freshman advisor right. counselor. Okay. okay, and they come out of the blue helping how you can increase your study habit, 
um, and how should you study um, then you have your advisors that will help you saying maybe you have too much in your plate slow down or give you a good advice how you can accomplish um, um, uh, for your success going forward. Mm -hmm. Also, if the student requires some extra help outside of the classroom, uh, there is a, uh, even professors have a one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one tutoring to accomplish what she wants. So she took all the advantages she could um, to <laughs> little struggling more to straight A's. So it sounds like the most important thing your daughter did was raise her hand yes. and say, I can't do this by myself. Yes. Who do I turn to? Yes. And when you do that, you will see hundreds of people rounding you, mm -hmm. coming helping. And one of the things that makes me so proud about Duke is there is no competition between students. They help each other to achieve the same goal. Hmm. Anybody want to follow up on that, on how your son or daughter um, I don't. I don't have a lot to process. add I, because I don't know um, the, many specifics. But I do know that John accessed an academic advisor uh, during his freshman year who was very helpful. Um, and I also know that as he's needed resources, when he's put his hand up and needed resources, they've been available. Disability Services has been um, very supportive. Um, professors are accessible here. You can go in, the class sizes are small enough that they know who you are, you're not dealing with TAs, you're dealing with the professors, and they have, they, from my vantage point, seem to be very interactive and very willing to uh, be involved in, in supporting, the children, supporting the students. How do you get, you can say children because there are babies, uh, how do you get your advisor? Just it magically appears? How does, how does your son or daughter get their advisors? Does anybody remember? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think. I think they were assigned. They're assigned. Okay. I yeah, think they're assigned. The first few years, mm -hmm. and then and they're a general advisor who may have kids from mm -hmm. from all different walks of life, and they're really geared toward uh, helping that new student um, to mm -hmm. to go in the direction that they think they want to go in. And then when they declare their major, sure. their major advisor comes from exactly. their school of study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and one of the uh, great thing about that is. Um, the Duke makes the students, the process of declaring majors becomes so easy for them. So they are not struggling, say, should I go this way or that way? Because, you know, the sophomore year you have to declare your major and that, you know, our, we are thinking it's a nightmare, right? I said, okay, are you going to go to neuroscience or biology or chemistry? And, you know, all the help Pyle had to declare said no dad we want to i want to go towards um, neuro, uh, neuroscience so did you have a different idea on that was there a family discussion about what yes. you wanted and what she wanted well, a little bit because you know uh, her goal was to do go to medical school now declaring the neuroscience major now the economic part of it if she does not get to the med school then what that the discussion we had you know, among family and and Pyle took that and Duke helped her and showed the you know the thousands different way it's not the medical school but if having the neuroscience major what she can do in the research and other areas that can make her very successful in her life so honestly from a parent's perspective we we want our children to get degrees and we're thrilled that they've come to this wonderful university but we would like them to have a job mm -hmm. when they leave and so you were reassured as a parent that her choice of major actually opened the door to many employment many possibilities employment. going forward. Uh, not only employment, the success, right, and, and what she can do and how she can achieve her goal. Mm -hmm. um, we've got people from all over the country here. We've got the Northeast, California, the South. Um, I know there are a lot of international students here. My um, son has uh, one of his best buddies from England. Where are your, your kids' friends from? Are they from all over the country? How have they made their social um, support system come together here? Well, my daughter has uh, not only friends all over the country, uh, but also from abroad, from Germany, from UK, from 
Bangladesh, India, you know, and and it's a small community, and um, even they build the community before she came here. Uh, no surprise, Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> and and they're discussing, you know, what color the dorm would be, you know, mm -hmm. you know those kind of things, and it becomes a community among themselves, and um, and again, it's it's not just them, but it's it's a whole Duke community, student community, community, but um, um, it's it's uh, you know they are so commingled and they look after each other if if their need. Um, anybody needs something that helped them, and it's vice versa. So mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Was Facebook uh, instrumental in John getting uh, his his feet on the ground when he came here? <laughs> I don't think so, but I think his um, friend groups are pockets in a lot of different places. Um, he seems to move from one group to another, whether it's within the Greek life, although he's independent. Um, friends he's made through the classroom environment, friends through band, through the, through the, through the sports that he supports mm -hmm. in band. You know, he has friends on the women's soccer team and the women's basketball team and the men's basketball team. It seems, from his perspective, at least from what I'm hearing, a very fluid social experience. And um, that there don't seem to, I haven't heard a concept really of cliques. Right. Um, or silos where you can't really escape one once you've been mm -hmm. in it. Tracy had a similar experience? <clears throat> similar experience, yes. Um, like she was saying, when, when she, Tracy never was interested in sports before, and then when she started working in the football office, where did that come from? But then she has football friends and people associated with the athletic side. And then, you know, uh, classes, you have uh, friends, make friends there, and then people who live on your hall, you get friendly with them. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, I agree with that, that it's kind of all around, you have friends from different areas. I know one question that often comes up uh, at all colleges, having just gone through the process this past year, I think I heard it at every um, every student presentation I was at, the question of Greek life. How, how Big is the Greek life um, at Duke University. How you, you mentioned that John's got friends who are in fraternities and sororities, even though he's an independent, doesn't seem to be a big deal. Is that anything that you all have heard about? Um, the, 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 the Greek versus independent, the the you know the different. I don't think there's any kind there. of uh, like I say. Even though it is a organization, I don't think it's. It's like if you're not in that organization, you can't be friends with them. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. For example, um, um, the piles dorm in, in West Campus, and and her friends and so forth. You know, she's even got the housing not being on that part of the group. So there is no distinction, or there is no um, that you are not part of that uh, fraternity or sorority, so you are separate. There is no feelings like that. That's great. That's great. My son actually is in a fraternity, and um, I would say he has as many friends mm -hmm. um, in the sports that he plays. Um, I know he's um, he's got guys in his study group from one of his classes. Um, and that would be his friend group for, for that particular thing. I think in the same way that John's had that experience, he has kind of little pockets all over mm -hmm. campus. I was just here with him on campus like, wow, you know a lot of people. Right. Um, and they don't all seem to match together. So they, you know, you're sort of intuiting this as a parent. You don't really know everything that's going on right. in your child's life. But it looks like <clears throat> there's a real wide cross-section throughout the campus that people associate with. Well, I know last year John was in Kilgo Dorm on West Campus as a sophomore. And it seemed as though his f floor or the dorm was essentially divided. There was a section with the football team and there was a section with one of the fraternities. And it struck me that, you know, it was Monday night football and a bunch of social experiences with the football team and a number of experiences with the fraternity. And it was really that exactly what we're talking about, that mix of freely going in and out of different experiences mm -hmm. and being welcome. And with a brittle bone condition, football was never going to be in his future. But yet he was welcomed and had a great time with the football players. That's really cool. And you, even, you know, if you are in the fraternity or sorority or not, you, you know, the, the students don't feel it, you know, that I'm in the group. They don't 
uh, even understand the differences. Right. How important was the uh, student <clears throat> activities fair in the fall of their freshman year in them kind of getting a sense of what all the opportunities were? There are service organizations, there's organizations. Uh, I saw a guy juggling on campus the other day, so I'm sure there's a juggling club here on campus. I mean, there's an amazing array of activities you can get involved with. Was that an important thing for, for Tracy in trying to figure out where she would make her way at Duke? Um, I don't know that she was um, into activities like that, mm -hmm. social or other. Like I said, she was very focused. So she did the, um, the tutoring um, in, in the community, uh, the Spanish tutoring in the community that she went to, um, I think it was an elementary school, oh, wow. and uh, helped tutor there. So I don't know that she did a lot of uh, activities that weren't school related or class related. Right, mm -hmm. right, yeah. And uh, I know Pryle's in a, um, one of the service uh, fraternity sororities. That's right, and uh, that, that is uh, all service, and, and even they go like, you know, uh, one of the islands looking after the horses, and, and you know, uh, recently she went in the Tiger Project, and how, how you know, uh, um, the animal related and how we can help, um, you know, uh, so that they don't get extinct or so forth. There's, you know, Saturday, Sunday, you know, she's so busy with that. Also, you know, in the Duke, <clears throat> if you know what you want to B. There's so many other things, activities like Pyle was in the choose the uh, the Global Health Brigade, mm -hmm. going abroad. You know, uh, she went to Honduras, helping even building the sanitary system there. So it's it's mind it's mind blowing. One of the things that Duke really stresses <clears throat> is that um, it's service learning, and the students here are learning in the service of society. Mm -hmm. And service is very important. Having a global perspective is very important. How have you seen your students change um, in that way because of that influence of the university in the four years, two years, three years that your children have been here? Hmm. I, John's been in the marching band, which has taken up a lot of his time. Um, but I do know that he goes to the Duke Chapel fairly regularly, and they, they do have a lot of service opportunities and mm -hmm. programs. Um, I've encouraged him to get involved in them. I'm not sure that he has. Um, but I, I do know that there is that um, emphasis and um, experience available on campus. And your daughter has done the Duke and Madrid program. Correct. Mm -hmm. She uh, went... Uh, the summer after sophomore year, and she was there for six weeks. Um, Tracy went to an immersion school from kindergarten through high school, Spanish immersion. So when they start in mm. kindergarten, they wow. only speak Spanish. So she was, of course, fluent. <clears throat> so when she, um, in that program, they live with families in Madrid. So the lady that she lived with was a... Um, uh, a single lady, she was a widow, and she had been doing it, I think Tracy said for like 30 years, had been having these students come over and live with her, and she said that Tracy spoke Spanish the best of all she had, so, you know, Tracy could just conversate with her, no problem at all, and one of the things she said that um, the lady would always feed her so much food, just cook tons of food for her. She was like, hey, I'm just one little girl here, but <laughs> lady, I just loved her, so she would just cook her tons of food, pack her lunch for her and everything. Mm -hmm. You recommend the uh, study abroad if uh, a student can fit it in? I was a little, a little um, apprehensive mm -hmm. about her going abroad, of course, but um, overall it was a great experience for her. Once she got there, got her feet wet, knew where to go, how to get there, and everything, go to classes, and the students live not too far from each other with other families on this, you know, like in the neighborhood. Right. So then they all get together and go to the classes together and then hang out at night together. And, and all stuff. the courses transfer back. It is oh, like taking a for Duke sure. class. Yes, she took two classes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, major change that you mentioned that I have seen in Pyle is thinking global. Um, you know, uh, we are about 35 miles north of uh, Los Angeles, a mm -hmm. small community, and she come. She came from a very small, you know, school in high school, and she was focused on herself, 
how she can go about and be successful, but what she experienced and what Duke gave it to her is just not her. Think global, mm -hmm. and as a result, she's even trying to go abroad. Um, you know uh, how we can prevent uh, um, terminal d diseases rather than you know uh, curing and and aftermath, if you will. Right. So she's trying to get into this summer or next summer uh, for a uh, her special research, and Duke is helping her tremendously. Um, so that's the major, in a nutshell, I can say, yeah. if I if I say what I what I my kid experienced in Duke is changing the mindset for myself to global. Mm. That's a, that's very significant. Mm -hmm. That's yes. huge. Um, let's talk a little bit about the classes. Um, <clears throat> Duke is a mid-sized school. Um, depending for your daughter, it must be a very big school. Uh, for some kids, it um, it doesn't seem that big. You know, it all depends on the uh, the environment that you've left behind. What's been your kids' experience in terms of the sizes of classes? Um, you know, we've heard horror stories at, at some universities where there'll be literally hundreds and hundreds of people and you're nothing but a number and the professor wouldn't know your face. Um, has that been your experience uh, here at Duke? Uh, not really, but, you know, uh, there are some classes that could be big because some of the common classes that all majors t has to take. So those classes could be big, but you know you have the interactive program that you have direct access to the professor. Um, and and if you are not, if you did not understand something, you can go back after class or before class you know, same day, and and ask any questions, and and the professor will spend time with you. If it's not one hour, it could be two hours. And those are typically the introductory classes, like the the beginning science, the right, beginning right, English, and right. so on. Wendy, what's uh, John's experience been? John has been thrilled with the class size. Um, he's in Trinity, which is a liberal arts program, although classics is fairly small. Um, he's required to take a lot of different courses in a lot of different disciplines. Um, he's had maybe a couple classes where they've been a hundred, like introductory computer science. Mm -hmm. um, he, most of his classes are around 30 and he said he's had several that have been 10, 8 to 10. Wow. And yeah. in addition to that, um, as, as, as was just said, the, the access to the professors has been uh, terrific. And in his experience, he's never had a TA. He's had only professors teaching him, and he has never heard of a TA um, teaching the classes. And that isn't something that's offered at all schools. And from my personal perspective, if I'm going to spend this kind of money, I would rather have professors teaching my child mm -hmm. than a TA. What about in labs? I know sometimes, um, the, for instance, in a science, there may be a, a large class, but then the labs break down to much smaller groups of 10 to 15? Yes. Um, even Pyle has about eight. In eight her lab? Student, yes. Wow. And what about uh, Tracy's experience? <clears throat> You know, I never heard her say anything about the size of the class being a problem. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if she had any large classes. If she did, they didn't bother her, and um, she never said anything about it. So I don't think that it was a problem for her. You know, I want to follow back on something um, that you said about how collaborative uh, the students are. John aspires to go to law school. That's a very competitive um, aspiration. There are a lot of kids who want to go to law school, and the competition to get into that that great school and have those great boards will be big. It, it seems hard to understand how how one can say on one hand it's a very collaborative environment and yet the reality is it's a competitive field that your son aspires to. Square that for me. Well, I think in my journey with John through the special education world um, there are federal laws that dictate um, what his special education accommodations are going to be. And those laws are federal. And yet they can be implemented very differently from school district sure. or college and university to college and university. 
what I've concluded along the journey with John is that the attitude starts at the top. And from the very beginning, um, starting with the parent open house uh, that was held three years ago at this time, um, I remember a parent on the panel answering the same question and she relayed that it was collaborative, not cutthroat. She had a daughter who was a cheerleader and in the engineering department. And that year, Duke had gone to the NCAA finals. And she participated. And her fellow students and professors forwarded the assignments, helped her with the labs, and, and supported her to be able to do that. In John's case, he um, was in a Gothic cathedral class. And there was a project that represented a substantial amount of their grade. And there were three jobs per project. And two of those jobs, John couldn't do from a physical mm -hmm. perspective. And one remaining job was to be bishop and to write a story, a historical fiction, really. Um, the amazing thing about that experience, from my perspective, is that um, they had to, that that historical fiction needed to be presented before a panel of professors. And, not, and he has a speech impairment. And at that point in time, his Botox used to facilitate his speech was wearing off. And there was, it's timed, and it, there was nothing that could be done. The speech was what it was. And what was utterly amazing and reflective, I believe, of the attitude here is that not one of the students politely mm -hmm. offered to deliver that speech. And I have to say, as his mother, and certainly 30 years ago in the same situation, I don't think I would have done that. And I think if you had a cutthroat ex you know, institution, he would have been asked to step aside, right. politely or rudely. That never even came up. And I think that says a lot about the experience he's having here. And if it's happening to someone with a speech impairment, I guarantee you it is helping to everybody else in the general education. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. What a beautiful story. And, and, and I think it does speak to the culture it does. of not just the institution, but the kind of students that they have chosen uh, to come here. I agree. But that's the attitude starting at the top. Mm -hmm. That's what Duke is valuing and looking for. Have, have your sons and daughters, um, your son and daughters, uh, found that their fellow students um, have been a source of intelligence, information, how-to um, in negotiating life at Duke, whether it's choosing the right class, figuring out what the description of a class really means, because sometimes what's in the book and what the reality is is uh, not always the same as my son figured out uh, with one class. Um, how important has that student uh, referral service been? No, um, in uh, my daughter's experience, um, like um, the seniors uh, here help uh, tremendously. And even uh, they will tell the course about, and even they will come um, and help telling um, her major verses how that course can help. Um, it could be a stronger class she needs to take that will help her much more. And, and even giving the course district description that is she wants to get into that you know, because like you mentioned that when you are looking at the course name and said okay is that what I want to do or what I'm gonna get into right. uh, later on um, but but like I said you know all the seniors and whoever t take them, you know they you know that brings to the thing is the Duke you may not think is a university is a community uh, Everybody knows everybody, and they come and help anything you want to. Um, there's a question that came from one of our Ustream viewers, and I think it's a really good one. How does Duke encourage the best professors to teach basic classes? You know, every school has a rock star professor. Duke happens to have a lot of rock mm -hmm. star professors. How does the school make sure that undergrads get them, that they're not all reserved for the you know, people in the grad and the master's and doctoral levels? Mm. Well, um, one of the experience is for my daughter, 
is the professor who wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'll agree with that. I'll agree with that. And I think Tracy had a class like that too, where <laughs> she actually the had the, the professor author of the book. Who, yes, yeah, author the of book. the book. Mm -hmm. and, and how did that change her, her enjoyment of the class? I think that the, probably the same way as his daughter, it was like, hey, this guy that's right here in front of me is the one that wrote the book. And I can, I can just get it firsthand, you know, like I don't even have to look at right. the book because he's there exactly. to tell me everything. And not only that, you know, my daughter's professor is the, in, in the Nobel panel. So, you know, she's trying to do with uh, research. Uh, actually, she became uh, his assistant research. <laughs> that's fantastic. So, mm -hmm. uh, but she, the professor is in the Nobel panel, and these are the guys mm. that students will experience. Right. First I think time. one of the other things that it's important to note for, for parents who are out there listening is that there are every semester there are professors that are teaching class um, who come from the highest levels. I know Steve Nowicki, um, who is at Academic Affairs, um, teaches a class every year. Uh, Dick Broadhead is a history um, mm -hmm. professor, and every couple of semesters or so, President Broadhead. Uh, teaches a class. So you oftentimes don't know um, very far in advance that the teacher you're going to get is, mm -hmm. you know, literally, you know, right. one of the guys who's on the letterhead right. <laughs> here at the university, mm -hmm. which I think is pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. And and I know um, uh, Dr. Nowicki said that he felt that teaching that class was one of his greatest joys, um, was getting to do a freshman seminar, which all freshmen have to mm -hmm. take. Um, and those are also small classes, and very often those classes are ones where you will get a professor who is one of the people that you've already heard about long before your student ever heard about coming to Duke. Right. And and uh, I you know like to add to it, if I may, that you won't see you know those are the people down to earth, and because of he's the writer of the book or up on you know people uh, student may not know. But you don't see that. They don't, you know, say, you know, it's a normal people and that person has no difference. Right, right. Um, you mentioned research and your daughter is working with a, a very noted professor as, as a research assistant. Mm -hmm. How do students take advantage of the opportunity to get involved in research? What is the process to make that connection with uh, a teacher or a department? Well, one thing, uh, the students in Duke will learn very fast that they cannot be shy, okay? Um, the opportunities are there, you have to go grab them. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you talk about it with your, uh, the, the counselor, the your advisor. advisor. You talk to, you go to the professor, uh, like uh, with um, 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 the, the research as, uh, Dr. Uh, Madans that she will be assistant to, she she just went to her his office and said, "Can I can I you know can I do this?" Uh, and and then he advised and said, "Okay, if you really want to do this, uh, how about this summer? Uh, because there's a lot of competition, you know, wh you know in, during the year. During the year, so will you be able to that, do that?" Now, Pyle had a choice to see mom and dad or you know, um, be, become the assistant. So those are the choices Duke will help you lead to mm -hmm. make in your life, which Wendy, one is important. Uh, research in a little bit different sense, John has sought out uh, an opportunity to write a thesis through the classics department, um, which I believe will is intended to be somewhat original research. Um, and, and worked with several professors within the classics department and now has um, decided to work with one in particular. And if all goes well, we'll graduate with distinction as a result of writing a thesis. And the process for, um, for parents who are watching to graduate with distinction, a student um, does essentially a year-long project. Mm -hmm. It's like a master's thesis mm -hmm. only, I only agree. before you get your master's. Right. Explain a little bit about what the process is for a student. Um, I, from what I understand, he sought out the classics department um, professors and worked among them to figure out a topic um, over this last year. And a, a topic evolved that both the professor and he were interested in working on together. And we'll start the work um, 
I gather he'll be reading this summer in his spare time <laughs> and um, we'll hit the ground running and start doing the work in the fall. But very um, directed, student directed. But again, the resources are available at Duke to create this supported self-advocacy. And your daughter had a double major. Um, and I'm not sure if the school frowns on that, if it supports that. You, you know, you hear you hear about a lot of kids who have double majors, and the, the number of requirements for a single major is significant. Um, why did she go with the double major? Was she uncertain about which area she wanted to, to go toward, or it just seemed the right well, mix of classes? Well, because she had um, taken Spanish all of her school life, so she decided she was going to major in Spanish. She couldn't just throw that away. And at first she was going to major in uh, international studies. And I think she took a cultural anthropology class, and when she took that class, she fell in love with it. So then that's when she decided to change her international studies major to um, the cultural anthropology. And in talking to the advisors, that was when she was trying to decide, now can I make this work? Can these two go together? If mm -hmm. I have this many classes here, can some of them work over here? So that was where the advisors definitely came in handy to to show her that yes, these can work together. You still can get out on time. And in fact, she got out early. So, I mean, she made it work. So How did she get out early? Um, she must have doubled up on classes at some point. Well, you know, I, I don't think she did because here at Duke, they don't really like you to take too many classes per semester. Right. And they call that overloading. So they didn't want her to overload. And I don't know that maybe she just, uh, maybe when she went to Spain and took those two ex extra classes, that did help there. Right. Because she wouldn't normally have taken any classes during the summer. And, um, and I think by some of the classes being able to work in both majors, mm -hmm. you know, elective, cross, list. cross mm -hmm. list, yes. And and that was how she worked it out. But like I said, she was focused on it, so she made it work. She was going to make sure that it did work. <laughs> and and uh, when Wendy was talking about the thesis, she was going to do that also, but it is a year-long project, and since she graduated early, she didn't have that whole year oh, to okay. do that. Mm -hmm. So she had started on it and then realized that she oh. was going to be able to get out early, so she didn't go that way. But she had thought about doing that also. So a lot of students are, 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 are motivated to do that yes. because it's, a, mm -hmm. it's an impressive distinction to have mm -hmm. on your, on your um, certificate, on your diploma. Um, parents who are watching this right now um, are thinking about, okay, the logistics of having a student at Duke. First and foremost, they got to sleep somewhere. All freshmen at Duke live on East Campus. Mm -hmm. How is that from a, to, from a parent's perspective of the student? Good thing? I, I think it's the, uh, one, it's the best thing could happen to my daughter as a freshman. Uh, because when you are coming, you are, you are acquainted with the personality, age, everything in one place. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're you're moving around, hanging around with the with the with the students, like you are exploring, they're exploring too. That's cross cross pollination, mm -hmm. you know, change of ideas. I think Duke did did a wonderful job uh, segregating them to an, one campus and leaving them together rather than you know spreading them around, and they wouldn't have the access and dialogues, if you will, among each other. Oh, I think it's great. I, I have to say when my son moved in or when he was moved in because it was just this magical thing. You get, um, you get, you get your marching orders and you're given a window <laughs> and you're giving a little thing to put in your dashboard. And of course, the car is piled up and things are falling out the windows. Who knew a boy had that much stuff? I don't know how you moved a girl in. But it's amazing. You drive on to, to East Campus and you park in front of your dorm and all of a sudden, I'm from New York. I thought they were robbing us. You know, they, <laughs> they start taking the things out of your car and these, true. these incredibly strong young men carry it up to your room and it was 100 degrees that day. Right. Mm -hmm. I barely broke a sweat. Right. And within I, minutes. Within yeah. minutes. Yes. And yes. They, yes. And you only had a few minutes you before get it was your car right. out of there right. and move on, lady. Move on, lady. And and my it wife, was amazing. My mm -hmm. wife rolled out the window. First thing she heard, what is the number, the dorm, I mean, room number? And before I got out, you know, the the, the trunk was open, 
things are gone <laughs> before I got out of there. Right. And then they said, okay, we have to find out the dorm room. And here it is. Everything is there. Oh, and they practically carry you up the stairs. I mean, it's yeah. really wonderful. Yes. Then when you're living in the dormitory, there is this magical person called your resident advisor. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about your students' um, interaction with the resident advisor, or were you aware that there even was one? Oh, no, I, I, I knew very much. Even um, I had a conversation. She came and gave her number and email address. Any concern that I may have that I need to contact um, for my daughter, um, she, um, I, hear, I heard it from, from my uh, daughter is she will periodically come and check, said how things going, how, how she is feeling, is she feeling homesick, you know, those kind of mm -hmm. questions, any help, you know, she needs, um, and, and finding places because they're all new, right? And, and where is the, you know, how she can better use the foot points, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, all mm -hmm. those advices, and uh, they were available 24 So she hours. was a great resource for yes. your daughter. Yes. Um, John's RA was av available. In fact, he was in the room right next door to John um, and accessible if John had questions. Um, another thing about the picking up on what you were saying about East Campus, um, I thought it was a wonderful way for th that year to really interact with each other from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And everybody there was in the same nervous position as everyone else. And in fact, you know, when you, you could see people coming on campus who you could just tell by the look in their face, they were upperclassmen. Right. I mean, they didn't have this really stressed out look on their face. <laughs> and, and so they could all sense that energy. And, and it, I suspect it made it much easier for them to put their hands out and say, hi, my name is, and mm -hmm. then they would all eat in the marketplace together. Um, and I, I, it has to make it a, a much easier transition to get into the Duke um, experience. Likewise, many of the f parent orientation was done on East Campus, and we were available a, made available, it was made known to us what the resources were going to be available to our students. So whether they accessed the, them or not wasn't you knew about them. as important right. as it was for me to know what there was so that if in fact there was a problem, I could say, well, you know, you have a professor who's living in your dorm mm -hmm. who's going to provide social opportunities for your floor in each floor during the year, has told us that he is a resource that you can go in and talk to one-on-one. -on -one. You have an RA, you have, the, you know. And so we knew what the resources were, um, should we in fact need to support our student from a distance. Yeah. And I thought that was incredibly helpful. Yeah, I don't so know whether John used them, but I knew they were available. Well, and the fact that you don't know mm -hmm. says a lot right there, that right. he was either comfortable and things were fine, or more likely, there was something and he needed to reach out, but he knew who to he reach out, out to. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing that's um, unique to the freshman class is this focus program, where a student can um, look at, I think there's about a half a dozen different um, uh, themes. And they can say, I would like to be a part of that. And it's a residential living thing, but not exclusively. So let's say we were all going to be in the, the basket weaving um, focus program. It wouldn't be just us. It would be us who are interested in basket weaving and all these other students who are our roommates and our, our home mates and stuff like that. Did any of your um, uh, children participate in that? Tracy yeah. didn't? Tracy did. Uh, my, yeah, mine did. She uh, did. My, yeah, Which she, one? She, she did uh, Exploring the Mind. Um, Miss Neuroscience, of course. Yes. Uh, <laughs> actually, in the one, you know, like yesterday, you know, Blue Devil Days, right. we came and uh, in, in, in uh, West Campus, we had the series of programs and demonstration what students can do. And she amazingly met one of the professors uh, who uh, it's, it's, it's drives the focus. And she got connected from the day one on the Blue Devil Days that she will try to get into the focus program with him, got his card and number, everything, and here she is. So, so again, being proactive, she made the connection when she was here on campus for, yes. for Blue Devil Days, and then she followed up. Yes. So back to your point of 
raise your hand, get in their face, exactly. you can make things happen. Mm -hmm. How was how was the experience? What oh, exactly happens? Oh, it, it was great um, because um, this is what she was trying to do, that getting the focus experience as well as getting the neuroscience and a uh, part of the pre-med requirement. So it serves three, you know, serve three purposes. So being a part of Focus actually allows you to tick off one of your academic requirements? Yes. Ooh, just by living there? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking to my son. <laughs> I'm making a mental note. This sounds amazing because, you know, the more you can get off, oh, off the ledger because, mm -hmm. you know, when you get to the end of the line, as you know, your daughter, I'm sure, those last that last semester or two, you're thinking, okay, how many hours do I have left? Mm -hmm. right. How many classes can yeah. I jam in? You don't, you don't want right. to make a misstep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. the exactly. And mm -hmm. you know, I, it 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 takes me to my college days, how sloppy I was planning, mm -hmm. versus I am seeing Payel how she is doing uh, planning. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, this is this is this is unique, you know. Mm -hmm. And she's a girl. You were a boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that might explain mm -hmm. as a mother of sons. I, I think I can. Yeah. See, am I right? Right, Wendy? <laughs> it's, it's a boy-girl thing in, oh in, in some respects. Um, let me, speaking of professors, and your daughter's obviously made a great connection uh, with the gentleman that you mentioned, were there favorite professors that your um, daughter and your son have had that um, have touched them in ways beyond just the classroom? Yeah, yes. Wendy? Yes. Um, John was in a managerial effectiveness class this past fall. And the professor had a, a um, project requirement in which the students were required to come up with their values in life and relate those values to their corporate leadership styles that they were studying in this course. And, and while this professor didn't, I don't think, wrote the book for the class, but just to give a different sense, I believe he had worked, had a long-term career at a high level at Procter & Gamble and is now a professor here. He had, I sat in the class for when this project was being assigned and also heard him speak. And it, it, he had um, an incredible wealth of experience that he was bringing to this, this class. Um, what was amazing about this particular um, assignment is that it was the first time that John ever told his story his journey. He's had um, a brittle bone condition. He wears bilateral hearing aids. He has a speech impairment. He was told he'd never walk. He now skis black diamonds um, and has ADD. And, and it was the first time he was required to tell his story and because his values were formed by that journey. Mm -hmm. And the professor said at the time, as a plug, I'm sure, but a number of students had come back and reported that this slideshow was very helpful in interviewing and that they had received some successful jobs offers. Um, John, you mentioned the TED, TEDx program. There was a student in the class who heard John's presentation and, and one thing led to another, which is why he's now doing the TEDx program um, uh, uh, speak speech. <coughs> But he also used it in his um, interviews at, at Blackstone. And it has, tr it's transforming his life. Mm. It's allowing him, Duke has given him an education to um, speak, to write, to analyze, to critically think. Um, and he's getting all of that as part of his liberal arts education. But what Duke has also empowered him to do is come to terms with his life's journey and he's now seeing in a very real way how that journey is working for him. Yeah. And he is going to leave here a changed person. That is absolutely a beautiful testament. And, and I think every one of us as parents mm -hmm. of a student here could, could speak um, to the way our children have been transformed mm -hmm. by, by individuals here, by the collective experience. Right. Um, that's wonderful. Um, again, because a lot of parents are watching this, it's, it goes without saying there is nothing more precious to each of us than our child. And 
we want to be reassured that the university our child chooses is a safe environment. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about any experiences or your own sense of safety and the role it plays here at Duke. Um, you've been here for four years. Um, I just tried to let Tracy know to always be with someone. I mean, of course, students are going to be students, and they're going to hang out and go where they want to go, but just go with someone. Don't go by yourself. So hopefully <laughs> that would deter anybody else coming over to, you know, mess with them or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, that was one of the things I told her. She never had any problems? She never had any problems. I. I didn't hear of any problems. How about that? Right, I didn't yeah. hear of any problems. Prial? <laughs> um, <laughs> as you know, the East Com uh, Campus, uh, campus is very close to downtown Durham. Uh, Duke has the university is an open campus. Um, student has to learn when you know West Campus being other side, right? Who is comes being is campus being towards downtown. Um, and their buses that get them back and forth. Yes, they're not walking. Right. They're not walking. Uh, also, every Duke student has a Duke card and to enter the building you have to use that card. Otherwise nobody is allowed, not even parents. Um, also, you'll see the, some blue poles around and should you have any kind of threat that you think um, you can press the button and instantly the university police will know where you at and and they, they will dispatch yeah. um, however you know like student has to be cautious too in, in any environment uh, mm -hmm. even in the best Definitely. place in the art mm -hmm. right? right if you are hanging around two o'clock in the morning you may ask for some trouble you know it doesn't matter whether you're downtown I or would not. also add that the cab services here will honor the Duke yes. card and you can use your Duke student card yes. to pay for a taxi cab so you yes. should never ever find yourself mm -hmm. exactly. in a situation that you can't get back to campus but, you know, let me just stop you right there because we just have a couple minutes left um, High school is ending for these students. Duke Fall will be here before they know it. What do you recommend? Give me one thing that you think, Wendy, each of you, their students should do to prepare for life as a Duke freshman. What do you recommend? I guess think about what do you want to get out of your college career. You're never going to have this opportunity again to live on a campus um, where there are outstanding academics and incredible athletic sports teams and a spirit that is unparalleled, I think, at any other university in this country. And what do you want your four years to look like in, in your memory bank when you're done? Tracy? Um, uh, you called me Tracy. Oh, I'm sorry. That's Tracy's right. mom. And <laughs> everybody does that, too. I would just say be prepared. Like like Wendy said, to be prepared to what do you want to do, what do you want to get out of it, and be prepared to work for it. Supriya? Mm -hmm. um, be ready for your determination and your aspiration. And you will hear from East Campus to Central Campus to West Campus, a one word, go grab the brass ring. <laughs> and I would add as a parent, um, read the course catalog. There is so <laughs> much information in there. It's big and thick. You can find it online. I recommend you get a hard copy of it and read it like a book. You will learn so much more about this university than anybody can tell you. It is an absolute cornucopia mm -hmm. of amazing opportunities, mm -hmm. of incredible people. And I'm delighted to say a wonderfully supportive parent body who are back home rooting for their children and their classmates to do well. Thank you so much. Wendy Broadbent, thank you for being with us. Penny Canada, Tracy's mom, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and Supriya Chakrabarty, thank you um, very much. And thank you all for tuning in. This is going to remain online. Um, come back, consult this, watch it with your child, um, get grandma and grandpa to weigh in. We love this <laughs> university and we're pretty sure that if you decide to accept that invitation to be a part of the class of 2017, you're going to love it too. I agree. Thanks so much.